Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Join me here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. This week, we are hearing from Emily Lex as our next guest in the Against the Grain series. Emily is a talented watercolor artist, a longtime blogger, an author. She's a friend. She's traveled with me to Rwanda several years ago to meet New Day Collection artisans. And she was actually one of our first really big bloggers that blogged about us 10 years ago. And it's been so fun to partner with her on her new journey. Her new book releases this month, Freely and Lightly, God's Gracious Invitation to Live live a life of quiet confidence. And what I love about Emily is she is not someone who would come across as being against the grain. She is a self-proclaimed nine on the Enneagram. She likes to keep the peace, but she has done a lot of things to go against the grain in her life. One story I wanted her to share is when she and her husband and her four children packed up supplies and hit the road for four months in an RV to go to all the different national parks. She pulled them out of school. Um, it ended up sending them on a journey of changing all of their lives, moving to a new neighborhood afterwards. And I think there's something really brave and bold about kind of noticing when your life, you're not living your life according to your values, according to those things that you wanted, and you're willing to interrupt that and change courses. She talks about that. And then also being an artist, being an artist to me is a way to go against the grain of our lives where we tend to flow in a scrolling life, a Netflix life. I think actually practicing creativity, getting present in our bodies is a way to combat that. So she shares a lot about that as well. I feel like this conversation with Emily will resonate with me for a long time. Here we go. Okay, so the last time I think I physically saw you, you were coming through Austin on a massive road trip. Yep. And first of all, we've been longtime friends. In fact, I was going through some old emails the other day because it was 10 years ago that I started the ambassador opportunity with Noonday Collection. And I, it might have been that my first ambassador, who was from Seattle, found out about Noonday through you because you at the beginning were such a, you've been uh-huh. such a strong supporter of what we do at Noonday. Oh, so yeah. thank you for that because from <laughs> the welcome. very beginning, you were just singing our praises uh-huh. and it's just been awesome. You got to travel with me to Rwanda in 2015. You've met our artists and partners and you've just been someone who's just showed up. You just show up. You just show up in your quiet, confident way. And oh, I've just gosh. wanted you to know I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, you know, I love you and everything that you do. And I have my, we always kind of laugh because noonday is usually like really colorful and bold and beautiful and I love it, but it's just not what I wear. So I have like, I think the tiniest studs that you even make are these like gold cube studs and I wear them all the time. I have them on today. So. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, we have a great new stud set that's out that I'll have to send you. Okay. That's like well, three studs. Yeah. I know. I'll, 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 I'll refresh like, your studs. <laughs> you we got like some the, good studs the daintiest now. daintiest thing and then you send it to me and I always love it. Yes. <laughs> we know your style, girl. We got I you know. covered. I we know. have got you covered. So when you were here last, you uh-huh. were on this amazing RV road trip I through was. the United States with yep. your four children. Yep. And <laughs> this series is all about going against the grain. And I remember thinking, okay, wow, she's going against the grain. Like you're, <laughs> you guys like sold your house, quit your job, mm-hmm. and you really lived in this messy middle because it was during that road trip that you weren't even sure what life you were going to go back to if you were going to move. I mean, not many people do that. I, I, just, I know. <laughs> you know that, right? Not <laughs> many know. people do that. Yeah. How many years ago has that been? Um, it was five years ago. So we went to Rwanda. When did we go to Rwanda? 2015? I think so. Or 14. Maybe it was I 14. Know. I think it was 14. And then um, I remember sitting around a table actually in Rwanda, like at the very, one of the last days, like, okay, well, what what are you guys going to go home to? What are some goals that you have? And I remember saying like, well, my husband Ryan has this idea to go on this road trip and I'm so resistant to it because I just, I like normal things. But maybe we should do it. And so I think it just was like a slow over the next year. I finally like 
you know what? If I don't say yes to this, we're never going to do it. So I finally said yes. And we, we did. We, it was four months long and we um, just packed up the only the essentials. I mean, you've lived in an Airstream. It, they're little. I think mm-hmm. we have like the biggest Very one little. they make. But uh, we have four kids and our oldest was in sixth grade and our youngest was in kindergarten. Um, and it was, it was the perfect time for us to go. I mean, there are so many reasons and just like from the surface level, it's like, what a dream. That sounds so awesome. And it, and it truly was. But I think one step deeper under that was like, we needed a family reset. And I don't know that we realized it completely until we did it. And even coming back and reflecting, like we just needed a reset of who are we? Who are we when we're just the six of us? Because our life was mostly spent in community with lots of other people. And we just didn't take a lot of time just to be the six of us. Uh, and when you're living in an Airstream and you're traveling and you don't really know people, like we would drop into, we we hung out with you guys. There were a couple of other families around the country that we saw, but mostly it was just us six. And I don't know, I feel like we just needed that chance to kind of... Um, reorient ourselves and figure out how to how to do just our family Uh, it was it was incredible it was absolutely life-changing for us when you look back now five years later what's like the first image that pops into your mind when I mention Mm -hmm. this season in your life Mm -hmm. um what is the image I just think you know what's interesting is with this with the covid and coronavirus um shutdown and the way that it's caused people to slow down and and really like be at home a lot it almost feels like we we already did that we did that one mm-hmm. time when we did our road trip so i feel like we did a lot of hold handing hold handing hand holding with the kids and uh Ethan is our oldest and he was just going through tons of those kind of middle school questions and faith questions and identity questions. And we got to be so present for it that it that wouldn't have happened in our normal kind of busy hustle life. And so I guess I don't know what the image is. Maybe just us holding hands for some reason. That's mm. the picture I have. It was like just a chance to reconnect and be so present with each other. It, um, and it was such a gift. How have you fought to keep what you've learned during mm-hmm. that time over the last five years, or have you not? Mm-hmm. Have you just um, drifted back? No, I think we have. Um, I think we after we came home from our road trip is when we moved to our new house, and where we lived previously was in a little neighborhood with tons of houses, and it was so wonderful to raise our kids. Um, with the neighborhood park and a million friends in the neighborhood. And then we moved to basically the complete opposite where we're on two acres and we're surrounded by woods and we don't, we don't see any neighbors from our house. So, but I think that for that season, we kind of needed that place of just, this is just our family. And so I think we got pretty protective and really, it, and we moved into a new community, and so we had to make all new friends. So I think we've just been really um, intentional about friendships and community and family time. Um, I think we've just been we've just been like slower. I think it just slowed us down. Even though wow. we have teenagers and high schoolers and sports and all of the activities, but um, even still, I think we've just been really cautious and slower. I think that, I think so. So how have you done that as your kids have gotten older? Because you said mm-hmm. your oldest was sixth grade and was going yep. through, you know, these identity and mm-hmm. faith questions, which certainly I've got two boys in middle school that are right there. And yeah. even my freshman who's still, uh, I mean, come on, we're, we're all I still know. figuring all. it all out, right? <laughs> totally. But the big yeah. questions definitely start happening in middle school. Mm-hmm. Um, so how have you managed to create intentionality for your younger kids that weren't on a four month road trip when they were mm-hmm. going through that season of life? Um, I mean, I think so much of it is our schedule. Have you read the book? Uh, it's John Mark Comer, The Ruthless Elimination yes. of Curry. Yes. So much of it is just taking time um, for our souls to rest, really. <laughs> And, and then building that into our daily life. So what does that look like? I I mean, I think it comes from top down. So it comes from me and Ryan establishing that and, 
have like having to reteach our kids. So when we lived in our old neighborhood, there were we had friends to play with all day, every day, and literally all day, every day, there were friends. And so then moving here where there just are no friends in our neighborhood. So we have to either invite people over or they need to be invited other places. So it was like breaking that habit and breaking that addiction to always needing to be with someone Mm -hmm. in order to be entertained, um, which I think is really hard. I have four really social kids and that was very difficult for them. And it still is. I mean, pretty much every day, Audrey's like, what can we do? Where are we going? And like with coronavirus, it's changed a little bit. There's, they're homeschooled and they're home a lot. And I think even that is like reorienting us to say, we don't always have to be filled with lots of stuff. Like there is, it's okay to just have an at home day and it's okay to be bored. And what does that look like? And how do you be bored? I just don't think that maybe this generation of kids or maybe me either, like we just don't know how to be bored. Um, so it's, it's encouraging creativity and being okay with like, sorry guys, we have nothing to do today. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then being that okay that you, me. and being okay that you might kind of be the jerk. Like that's totally. what's been hard for me is, is making these very against the grain decisions yes. and my kid, it's not popular. My kid, yeah. I'm not the popular prom queen in my family, <laughs> you know? I know. I mean, I and know. it's hard. It's hard. It like is. this year we decided that um, two of our kids requested, uh, had a gift request for for tech for Christmas. I mean, one was like a Nintendo Switch and something else, like some other whatever. Uh-huh. And we just decided, you know what, if you, um, our family values are, you know, creativity and stewardship and connection and generosity and integrity. And we, if you want tech, like that's a very low on our, our values mm-hmm. list. And mm-hmm. we want to gift you things that spark creativity and spark connection. And so if you want those things, then, you know, we'll let you get them, but you need to work and save for them. Mm-hmm. And it was devastating. <laughs> like I'm, we're talking devastating because that was like it. That was the whole list. Like there was yeah. literally nothing else on the list. So <laughs> right. they had to come up with new things to put on the list. And I felt like I did. It didn't feel good. Like it's not yeah. fun to make these decisions. Um, but now you know we're a couple months in, and my one kit. First of all, they've been working, so they've been you know working, <laughs> saving, and motivated, which is great. And then one of the kids is like completely changed his mind yeah. and. And it came up with something else where, he, and he came in with this whole speech. He's like, mom, let me tell you, this sparks creativity oh. because it's going to be outside and it's connection because um, I need to do it with someone else and it's stewardship because I'm going to have to learn how to take <laughs> care of it. I mean, he had this whole speech yeah. and I was like, okay, okay. okay. And Great. plus he's not going to have to wait to save $500, which is what the other thing. Right. But, you know, I have to say these decisions don't feel good. And I think sometimes when we hear, um, you know, you're just explaining like they need to be okay with being bored. It's probably not tra-la-la and your children are like, okay, mom, then let's just bake cookies today. So tell (laughs) us what that has looked like informing our kids because this is not easy stuff. This is Mm -hmm. like making decisions that like their other, our other friends aren't necessarily making and then they're building their case against us. And it's, yeah. it's, yeah. I know. Tell us about that. Well, and it's, and it's bigger kids. So my oldest is almost 17. Then I have 15, 13 and Audrey's almost 11. And I feel like, it, especially with the kind of spiritual and emotional tra- transformation and work that I've poured myself into for the last five years, I feel like they probably, they roll their eyes at me, I'm sure, but their emotional health and their spiritual health is so important to me. And so I can look at like, you know, all these like teenage parents there, we're all trying to figure out what do we do with technology? And so sometimes we'll talk to the kids and, and maybe what a parent will do is be like, you only get two hours a day or whatever it is. And, and then the kids will be like, well, why? And you're like, well, because I said so. But I think that what I always try to do is like, but why? Like, why do I only want you to have it for two hours? And then I think it's the harder work, I think, is trying to have that conversation with them to say, okay, I don't actually know because I didn't grow up with technology. So I am trying the very best that I can as a parent to make a wise choice. And here's what I know. Anytime you are filling your life with 
with anything that's causing you to be distracted or causing you to be addicted to it. My goal as a parent is to help you be self-controlled. <laughs> my goal is to help you understand what that balance is. And so it's having those conversations where it's like, let me explain to you why, so that I'm not just coming off as a jerk. And Jessica, I think you did that when you're like, okay, well, here's our values. And if a Nintendo Switch isn't gonna do those values, then maybe that's not the thing that you actually want because my job as a parent is to grow you into an emotionally and spiritually healthy person who can have some self-control. And I mean, that's the, I think that's the hard work of parenting older kids. Little kids, it's like, let's keep them safe. And, um, you know, I really enjoyed dressing them really cutely. <laughs> that was really fun for me. Totally. Little. And now the work is like, how do you raise kids who can make really good life choices? And that takes more effort as a parent to have to to think like why why is this important? Let me explain it takes that. Let so me... much effort. Because we feel like we're back into the toddler myself. phase. I know we feel like we're back in this toddler phase again, where yeah. we're just like why why pouring why? well and just pour, yeah, and then also just pouring <laughs> yeah. so much effort into mm-hmm. our our family, and it's calling mm-hmm. Joe and I to kind of also be like, are we setting these yeah. standards of integrity and totally <laughs> connection and creativity and, totally. and all of that? I know. How do well, you- and then giving, sorry, and then giving them lots of like, also, I recognize that I didn't grow up. I don't know why we're talking about technology, but I didn't grow up with technology like this, but they do live in a culture where this is what they do. And this is sometimes how they connect with their friends. So to me, that seems weird that that's how you connect. But if, playing Fortnite with a buddy who lives in Texas is is how you connect with him. Like, yeah, you can have a half an hour of that. And so it's just like doing a little bit of give also. Right. To recognize yes, this absolutely. is weird, but also it's what they do. <laughs> it's also, I think, it's just being able to ask the questions that create mm-hmm. self-awareness for them. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, yeah. well – are you, why are you going to this right now? And, yeah. you know, and then also me just being really open, like, man, I'm not feeling healthy today, at which there's been plenty of that because my, I am not a COVID girl. You know, it's <laughs> funny because watching, you know, listening earlier about the slowdown and, mm-hmm. you know, I am someone that like, I would wake up Monday and, you know, my job's been crazy, like has always been crazy. It's, it's not because as much anymore, just because I'm not, traveling around the United States mm-hmm. and the world. So that's that's created such more more margin in my schedule. But I also used to be like, oh, what are we going to do this weekend? Who are we going to hang out with? And I'm like already planning a party. I totally. thought for years <laughs> that every Friday night, everyone was just having a yeah. party and I wasn't invited. Yeah. I just thought that's what you did. And I remember a friend of mine a couple years ago was like, you know, we're just like hanging out at home and watching a movie together as a family on Friday. And I was like, and it's what? that whole thing that you said <laughs> about, you know, the six of you and just mm-hmm. really saying, you know what, it's the six of us. And I think that for sure, COVID for me, is it, I've embraced the five of us. Like, mm-hmm. this is us, you know, mm-hmm. and and like, I mean, it's Friday night. I'm like, I don't know what we're doing tomorrow. I don't, you know, I don't care, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and it's not a party every night. And it's just kind of reorienting ourselves to like, wait, maybe that's normal. Maybe that's okay. Maybe that's what's normal. Yeah. yeah maybe the party every night is what's <laughs> is not normal or healthy yeah. or the expectation. And and that's okay. And we can let that go. Yeah. That, definitely been forced to let that go. And I think mm-hmm. that's been good. I think that's actually been good. And then also not good. I think also totally. there is a very unhealthy hermiting habit mm-hmm. that's happening where mm-hmm. now people – we're just so low energy and drained mm-hmm. that, you know, we're almost choosing isolation. Mm-hmm. I think it's hard to unchoose it when you're – people are just going through so much. I mean, I it's know. just – it's really hard. I mean, it's not just COVID. Like, I have – oh, I, there is no one in my life that is not going through additional grief, mm-hmm. death, loss. I mean, it's just – it's 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 a lot. We're all going through a lot. So I wanted to talk about art because um, – that I did a series at the end of last year with um, Dr. Kurt Thompson, therapist, and he wrote The Soul of Shame and Anatomy of the Soul. And his upcoming book is really about 
um, beauty and the importance of putting ourselves in the path of oncoming beauty. And he really sees that as almost like this. I don't think he'd use the, the language weapon, but that is one of these things that in this time of um, where we're, we're in a time of loss and grief um, and disruption um, and high technology use, that there is an idea of like this practicing creativity mm-hmm that can actually draw us in. I want to hear about how being an artist and creating has really helped you specifically during this last year. Um, I mean, I totally agree with what he's saying that it is it, where I've kind of landed with um, being an artist. I, I've had a hard time identifying myself as an artist because it just feels like such a fancy reserved term. Like it's only reserved for the people who are like in art galleries or do commissions or, you know, like I think, I don't know, for some reason, that's the idea in my head of what an artist is. And a couple years ago, um, I just was after kind of going through a lot of transformation about identity, I was laying on my closet floor and I'm like, God, just tell me like, what do I do? What am I supposed to do now? I've been set free from so many things, but like, what do I do? And I heard him kind of speak to my spirit, like be an artist. And so to me, I took that as I need to go paint. And I haven't, I hadn't picked up my watercolors in quite a while. And so I got them out and I started watercoloring. And then um, that's what prompted me in 2019. I did a little painting every single day because it just felt like, okay, God is asking me to be an artist. So I think I need to just commit to like, I'm going to practice this every day. And so for, yeah, for a year, I did a little painting every day. And I think over the course of that year, um, First of all, I think that what art does, and in particular, maybe watercolor, but I think no matter what your art form is, I think it does it. It allows you to just be really present with what you're doing. And so it like, um, you shut off all of the to-dos, you shut off distraction. And so you're just there and you're present and you're creating. And there's something so life-giving about just being in that moment. Um, and then at the end you make something and you're like, oh my gosh, that was really pretty. Or, oh my gosh, that was terrible. I'm going to throw it away. And it's like, it's okay either way because you just created it. Uh, but I think what I've learned about what it means to be an artist is to, to look and to see and to find shadow and light and form and shape and color and to appreciate that and then to capture it and then share it. And so, um, where I think where I think I've landed is that the reason that we create things that are beautiful and appreciate things that are beautiful and, and name things that are beautiful is that it reveals um, the goodness of God. And it reveals like how orderly and how creative and how amazing, you know, with nature and color and shape and form and shadow and light, like all of that stuff is just a reflection of God's character. And so it's always for me, like it's so important to pay attention to what's beautiful because I think it just, I don't know, it just allows you um, like, a, like a little moment of like, oh yeah, God, I acknowledge you. You're there. And look how, look how beautiful you, you allowed this to be. And you're so good. <laughs> it's like this little act of worship. Um, and I think in, like when we just live with so much um, disorder and ugliness, I think it's so important to turn our eyes to look at the things that are beautiful so that we can remember like that God really is good. I mean, every single day, that is a discipline to do that. Tell me, what did that look like? Because did you give yourself structure? Did some days you just go, okay, I'm just going to paint some dots and count that as a, <laughs> okay, I did it, I, you know. I know, a, a couple of times. But mostly um, the little watercolor paintings that I do, they're on a very small piece of paper. And so they take me about 25 minutes. And I just feel like I should surely be able to find 25 minutes in my day to do something that first of all, I feel like God's called me to, so it's an act of obedience. And second of all, it's really good for me. <laughs> so surely I can find 25 minutes. Uh, so for me, I just created a, a habit of like 
I think it was about two o'clock every day was when I kind of needed to wrap up my work day before the kids got home from school. And it gave me an hour to create my thing and then take a picture and post it to Instagram. So that was my routine. I don't think that that's like not prescriptive, but I think it's just like choose something that's really small, that's doable and give your, like you can carve out 25 minutes there. Like there's gotta be a way (laughs) to do that thing. That's really good for Mm. you. Yeah. What are some other avenues if someone's like, oh, I hate watercolors Mm -hmm. or, you know, although I have to Mm -hmm. say when we, we did, we pulled away a few months ago as a family over Thanksgiving break and that we'd been working on our family values for forever, but just had not landed. (laughs) So we finally were like, we, like my kids are like old now, like they're going to be in college. We're going to be like, okay, here's what, you know, here's our values. Right. So we finally landed the plane and, um, of course, I'm still procrastinating on now. I actually had thought about maybe Emily could paint these for me. But one of the things we did in launching them with our kids was we brought paints and we brought um, some canvases and some watercolors. And we just gave their five family values. So each of us took one and just painted what that value meant to them. And um, listen, we're not some artsy family you should see i mean well a couple of my kids really nailed it but let me tell you my husband's was rough okay and he's actually a maker i mean he's a he's a carpenter yeah Yeah, i know but it was an artist in his own way (laughs) in his own way apparently not on canvas um (laughs) but we all sat there and we painted together and Mm then um and by the way just for the listeners i just our family is messy. I mean, honestly, we're going mm-hmm. through stuff. Like, it is not – it wasn't like the kids were like, oh, yay, <laughs> oh, you <dreamy>. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then once we get into it, it does. It gets you very present in your body. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. – but I have to say I haven't done it since. And yeah. well, I don't know what's keeping me from it because I, mm-hmm. I do – we ended up that whole week spending time – painting. So then it then the paints were just out. And so then kind of when the kids got bored cuz we all tech was at home, that was another thing. We just it was just a detox week and <laughs> um and so then it was suddenly like like Jack was like making these amazing watercolors mm-hmm. paintings and I was like, "Whoa, I didn't even, you know." And yeah. And I don't even know if that's what's led now. Like even all of my kids are in an art right now. Amelie's taking piano and Jack is taking choir and, you know, Mm -hmm. Holden's in art. And so anyway, what are those ways that we can, if, you know, you, you have this moment of like, I am an artist. And so an artist makes things and I'm going to make. Okay. So Emily has a new book out um, called Freely and Lightly. And it is about this journey of Mm -hmm. quiet confidence and owning your, you know, I am an artist. So tell us a little bit about how we, if if we're not like, I'm a watercolor artist, you know, how do we incorporate this sort of this act of of worship and meditation into our Mm -hmm. lives of being that creator. Because I do think, and Emily, I'm so glad your book is coming out now because truly it is an act of restoration, being able to to paint and create. And I'm telling you, I am not a painter. And even me during that week, I was like, oh, I did it because of Kurt. I did it because I had read some blog posts by Kurt and he said, you know, get in your bodies, create, like be an artist. And so I was like, okay. I went to the paint store. I didn't even know what I was asking for. I was like, <laughs> Find me the cheapest thing possible. I bought a bunch of cheap <laughs> right. brushes, you know, and uh, and we – but then suddenly we were sitting around a table on a random, you know, Friday night painting. And I'm like, I never would have seen that coming. So yeah. – There's your so party. How do, yeah. Do you do that as a family? No. Um. Okay. Here, let's see. Here are my thoughts. When the kids were little, we always had a big jar of crayons and scissors and markers and paper always available to them. And, and it, oftentimes it littered the kitchen table and it was, you know, annoying because you're like, there's always just stacks of paper all over the place. But I will say that that one act of letting stuff be out that's creative and accessible has, has really fostered this creativity in my kids. Um, and so for me, like I have a desk that is in my office where I keep my paints and they're out and they're accessible. And 
it's so helpful. Like you said, like when they're out, then yeah, Jack's going to go to them because it's like something that's just right out there. If it's a whole process and a chore of getting them out of storage and then setting them up and, and then you have to clean them up at the end of it. So I think tip number one, <laughs> tip, I don't even know that I'm a tip person, but whatever. <laughs> here's, here's my <laughs> suggestions uh, is find a find a space where you can leave the things out and accessible or may, or if they can't be left out, at least make them very accessible. Number two, okay, I love bar and Pilates. That's like the way that my body wants to work out. But I have friends who love to run and I know you like, I don't, what do you do? You go to spin class, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, so like we we all think it's so good to work out and I want everyone to love bar and Pilates as much as me but they don't have to. Like, it's okay that you love spin and that Erica likes to run and you know, like Casey likes to lift weights or whatever. And I think it's just learning to say, this is the thing that I love doing that makes me come alive. And it doesn't have to look like what someone else is doing. And so part of it might just be dabbling in lots of different things. But I do think that we can pay attention to how we naturally are creative. So I don't, I mean, what, what I was thinking about when you were talking is like, okay, you might not be a painter, but Jessica, you've built this company and you are so fashionable and you love putting patterns and outfits together and your house is so beautifully decorated because that's your creativity coming out. So how can you maybe say, these are the things that I really love doing that make me come alive and how can I do that a little bit every day? So if it's like sketching new designs or... Um, I just saw the other day that Jessica Turner, a friend on Instagram, she's really into like embroidery, like, or knit, my mother-in-law knits a ton. And so it's, it doesn't have to be painting or watercolor or knitting or embroidery or fashion design, but find the thing that you just are, that you love doing and figure out how do you can do it. I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. there's my there's my like tip of the day. I guess it doesn't have to be one thing. And I think when we think of artists, you think of like drawing and painting. But um, I'm, my kids create with cardboard and duct tape all the time, and that is like that is they that is so creative to them. So uh, pipe cleaners. we buy them a lot of duct tape. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> That's actually that's actually a good idea. That makes me want to go buy duct tape today. I know. My um <laughs> Mason is 13 and he's really into making I and mean, it sounds so dorky, but it's like whatever, it's very creative for you. Uh these like um Mandalorian helmets that you can make out of cardboard and duct tape and they're actually oh. very impressive. So he like bought a pattern on Etsy. <laughs> he's been making these things. It's That's cool. Yeah. I, know. I love that. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um yeah, my daughter asked for a sewing machine for Christmas. So right. she's been sewing, but I, I have to admit that she had it out on the dining table, which you I walk know. into our house and it's a dining room. Right. And <laughs> I was like, oh, you know. I know. But I know. she she's put it in her room now. But honestly, we have this pool room. You know, what we we've remodeled our house for the last two years. Mm -hmm. So our we turned our guest room into a pool room and I have been wondering, like, you know what? Forget it, like, looking pretty. I could move those leather yeah. chairs out into, you know, I could sell them and we could put some craft table up. And no, it's not going to be pretty, but uh -huh. what matters more? Because it's true. It's when these things are out. And our dining room table was like that for the last couple months. And she got into pipe cleaners. And so then then the boys will just start doing all the pipe right. cleaners. And yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's like if this well, stuff is accessible – that my kids have destroyed our dining room table with hot glue and clay and and that's sad but also it's okay it's a table and i only have them for a few more years and then i will have a really perfectly beautifully clean house <laughs> so, seriously so i always have to keep that like oh my gosh all of this cardboard scraps are driving me crazy but also they're only here for like five more years. So I can do five years. Well, and I know you have, and I don't know if this is a book that's available on Amazon, but you have a some a watercolor book where you can I actually do. purchase it. And then yeah. is yeah. it just for the holidays or do you have others? No. Cause well, I so I have two. I have one that's a little, it's I call it a watercolor workbook and it has little animals. And then I had one at Christmas time. And then over this next year, like I'm gonna create a flower one and a summertime one. And um they're just available on my website, so emilylax.com. And there's, I think that they are. That's so a fun great place to begin. 
the sketching is already done for you and yeah. then you just have to paint it in. So it's great for kids, but it's also great for if you just want to kind of like try out watercolor. <laughs> so that's, that is a fun resource. And I try to, I mean, that's my goal is to like create easy ways to help, help people be creative. Um, and that's a really, that's a fun one. Well, and I love watercolor because it is a bit unpredictable and you're allowed to be a little bit messy. Totally. Yeah. And so it's a little bit less intimidating uh, than for sure. <laughs> other art And forms. it's so accessible. Everyone, if you don't have one at your house, you can easily get an ex- inexpensive set of watercolors. Yeah, and it then, is. It's, this is making – I'm going to do this. It. I'm going to do this. You should. <laughs> you know what's hard? I feel like right now – I don't know. I'm not going to speak for everyone, but I I have a very low grade just weariness. And, you know, back in the spring a year ago, I had all the motivation, like, I am going to learn watercolors. I am going to do all this stuff. And I was because I'm a pretty highly motivated get her done gal. And that's just, it's gone. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. just, it has left me. And so, it's almost like now the discipline or just the just the act of going and just opening it. But then once you're in it, you know, mm-hmm. it's like I never regret working out. Right. There's never a time where I'm like, wow, I really should not have, you know, gone on a walk today, you know? <laughs> yeah. And yet I feel like a lot of us were in these habits mm-hmm. now of of not doing those things that we know mm-hmm. are good for us because they just mm-hmm. feel Herculean, you know? Well, and I think like in last March, we're like, oh my gosh, we have all of this time on our hands. What are we going to do? We're going to bake bread and we're going to read books and we're going to do watercolor. And we're like, we're almost a year into this kind of new life. And I think, yeah, we are all a little bit tired of like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not motivated. (laughs) So it really is a discipline. It's saying like, what is really good for my soul health and maybe you know, my physical health, it's really good for me to go on a walk or go work out. And I have to force myself to do it. And some of this is like, what's really good for your soul? Um, I always think about that with reading. Like I love reading a good a novel. And if I get out of the habit, I'm like, eh, I don't think I want to read. But then once I pick up a book and it's so good, I'm never regretful that I read a really good book. It just, you have to get back in, you have to like discipline yourself to get back into it. And I think the encouraging thing for all of you guys listening is it's not Herculean. Like we build it up mm-hmm. in our minds to be Herculean, right. but then all it takes is that one step in that direction. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you're in it and it's, oh, it's so good, especially now more than ever. And that that is really, I do believe that artists, art is a way of going against the grain because I think that the natural flow of our lives is to consume and mm-hmm. not to create, even though I believe oh. creating is what where we find our true selves, you know, mm-hmm. in that act of, of creating, partnering with God to, to create, bring something new, whether it's cooking. I mean, I've even lost my mojo around cooking and uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously <laughs> not in the best place. We need some tell. motivation here. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. But you know what? At least you're admitting it. At least like there's a lot of people who feel the exact same way. So We're kind of all in this together, trying to figure it out. Emily has such a grounded presence. I love how she describes what making art means for her. There's shadow and light, form and shape, color. You appreciate it, you capture it, you share it. And the way she's turned making art into such a meaningful practice for creating is powerful, especially right now when we are all needing to accept these invitations into beauty. I am finding that beauty is the way to combat some of the isolation that I'm experiencing right now. And in fact, for Lent this season, instead of taking something away, I added something and I'm taking uh, just a little walk every day. This is not my workout. Y'all know I've got my workout times. It's just a short walk, maybe a walk around the block, maybe a walk around the neighborhood. And it's simply a time to get in my body to notice, to say hi to neighbors. Um, That is really came from inspiration from this talk. So go find the artists in your life and learn from them right now. I think it's especially what we need during this moment. To keep up with Emily, you can go to emilylex.com. And before we go, I would love for you to review and rate the podcast, share the podcast, tell other people about the podcast. That's how more people are finding the show. 
Our wonderful music is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kofoltz, and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. <laughs>